Okay, so I know the last one went on longer than we want the uh, chunks of this lecture to go. Uh, so I'm going to try to do this one in a condensed form and, and get this down to a reasonable amount. Um, but do know <laughs> that this is a complicated story. And if we're trying to cover all this ground in a short period of time, we have to be aware of the complexities of what we're looking at. So there are historians who call the age in which classical Greece through classical Rome exists um, a very special thing that's happening in the world. It's called the Axial Age by one. It's called the Great Leap of Being um, or the Great Transformation by other folks. You can read more of this slide later. But basically, it's pointing out that at the same time, all over the world, the same uh, types of changes are happening. Right. There's Buddhism and Hinduism emerging at the same time in India as Confucianism and Taoism in China, as Socrates, Plato and Aristotle, the great philosophers in Greece, which I'm like, asterisk, come on. They are not thinking the same kinds of things as either Lao Tzu or Buddha. Like <laughs> the fact that people are doing philosophy at the same time seems like a real stretch. Um, and in Palestine, there's Jesus. No, no, there isn't. Jesus doesn't come along until much later. Um, and I think the only reason this window stretches as far forward as it does is so that it can include Jesus. Um, and Zarathustra is in Persia. Really? Um, here's our timeline. Let's remind ourselves. Uh, this is what the axial age theory is proposing. Um, this is a little bit more like it. Zoroastrianism is much earlier, Jesus is much later, and Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism all have origins that go back to as far back as they can remember. The, the only other cool thing I'm going to point out on this slide, but we're going to talk more about it next week, is that Buddhism totally does influence Jesus, and that is totally possible because of the Greco-Bactrian Empire. <laughs> um, but after that, all kinds of shit happens. I would propose that maybe the explanation for this being an axial age is actually just that the closer you get to modernity, the better records we have. Because the more people are writing written documents in documentary culture. So as time goes on, we get more key figures. And if we're really obsessed with the great man idea of history... Then we start to think, well, there are just more great men. Probably not. The world is a lot messier than that. It's a lot messier than simple cause and effect. And it's a lot messier um, than just great men. So let's think about history as the way that we try to make sense of that messy world. Not to understand the past as it really was. We can't access that, right? Uh, even Khaldun told us so. It is to make sense of and to understand ourselves in the present. We tell histories as the story of empires or great men, or when we do this, we miss the complexities, the intricacies, and the cross-pollination that is happening in a rich world around those people that we've decided to focus on. And when we focus only on those people or those empires, we miss all of the other details. So historical materialism is a form of doing history that specifically seeks out material culture in an attempt to understand how, how a society worked on the most fundamental levels. How did people eat? And if that's how they ate, then how did they dress? And how did they interact? And how did that affect so, uh, um, social structures? And on and on and on. And if we look at how people had to live, like actual people, all the people, not just great men, um, if we look at how they had to live their lives, we get a really messy picture, but perhaps a richer and more interesting one. And maybe one in which more of us can see 
figments of ourselves and connect to our past. So I'm going to end by talking about one other model of history writing that still exists. People still do it. It's also wrong, um, but it's really common and it's super annoying that it is common because as you'll see, it is almost as simplistic as the simple cause and effect. And it is at least as myopic, right? Or, or excluding of other points of view as the great man theory. And it just like bundles up the worst of both of these theories together and says, this is definitely how humanity works. Um, and it's dangerous and we still buy into it. So it's worth taking the time to really understand this. Um, this is Hegel's model of history. And I call it Hegelian history of modernity with a capital M because modernity is the moment where we say, ah, yes, I recognize us as far back as this, but no farther. Why is this class ancient and medieval cultures? Because those are on the other side of what we understand to be us. They're temporally foreign, as even Khaldun would say, right? But you have, so you have on the other side of this barrier between modern and before, that's the pre-modern. And then on this side is the modern world. And that is how core humanities is shaped. 201, the old stuff. 202, our stuff. The stuff where we recognize ourselves, right? And this comes from a 19th century thinker, we'll just call him that, um, George Hed Hegel. And he had this idea that this, that history works by every age having a kind of thesis. Or he, t he borrows from Nietzsche, who's a little bit older than he is, um, who, who characterizes the spirit of the age, the zeitgeist, right? The thing that everybody at once is somehow thinking about um, magically. That's the thesis. But in every age, there's a thesis and an antithesis, right? The opposite. There's a force that is pushing for um, a particular point of view, a particular way of life. And then there's always a conservative force that is pushing back against this. And I mean this not in a political sense, but the actual meaning of these words. There's the progressive force that wants to progress. Progr like I'm backwards from you all. So progress, right? They want to go forward. And then there's the conservative um, that wants to push back and look backwards for a sense of how things should go. These two things are always in tension until a point where they kind of merge and they resolve their differences. And the thing that you get in that resolution is synthesis. So you have a new equilibrium, uh, but that synthesis then produces a new thesis and on and on it goes. <laughs> um, and that this gives us a model of history where time equals progress. And that is the idea that as time goes on, humanity always gets better. Or they're always, humanity is always marching towards its own perfection. The idea of progress is that you become better the farther forward in time you go. So this idea, something that governs our understanding of our place in the world, this is called a meta narrative. So it's the narrative that makes sense of all of our narratives. So why do we put the narrative of Mesopotamia and, uh, ancient Greece and the ancient Rome and then medieval England and then America. Why do we put that in a story and tell it as our story? Because they all fit a bigger story that we understand is organizing time and the entirety of time. That's a meta narrative. This is dangerous. Because the logical end of thinking this way is that perfection is inevitable, which means 
that we can justify anything if we can call it progress. And if we can look at anything and say that it is more progressive than something else or more advanced or more developed, right? It is built in to the language that we use to describe everything we do. And where this takes us, the end logic of the idea of human perfection comes to us in eugenics, which we have been talking about most of the semester in one way or another. The idea that you can create a perfect human race is rooted in racism, <laughs> um, ableism, homophobia, uh, xenophobia. The idea that there is a perfect race and that some people are better than others and can be bred to create a more perfect race is what leads to eugenics and the Holocaust. That was a massive psychic trauma for most of the world. And the other, the other end of this is technological progress. The idea that technology for the sake of progress is always inherently good leads to the development of science and scientific discoveries without ever stopping to ask ourselves if it's ethical. Of course it's ethical, it's progress. The very notion that it is a development means it is inherently justified. We can do anything. We can even take apart matter itself and split an atom and destroy hundreds of thousands of people in an instant. This is progress. So if this model of history, the idea that time is progress, if that's what this is, um, then the way we tell our, our stories of the past matters not only in how we understand ourselves, but also how we understand what is ethical about the way we interact with the world. So I want to end this lecture um, by talking a little bit about some things that don't fit the narr narrative. So let's talk a little bit about this classical moment in the axial age. And the things that I'm going to tell you are going to not fit the meta narrative that takes us into time equals progress and modern is always better than medieval, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I want you to just know these things, put them in your brain and allow them to trouble your understanding of how history works. Um, Eratosthenes was a Cyrene, so North African, uh, but Greek Hellenistic uh, astronomer. And the, the biggest thing that he did is that he accurately calculated the circumference of the earth, like very, very accurately. So to calculate a circumference of the earth, you must know that the earth is a sphere. It is round. Literally nobody thinks that the world is flat. Columbus does not have a genius idea and say, oh, the world is actually around. No, none of that is true. Um, we have known for a very long time that the world is a sphere and we've known at least since Eratosthenes about how big it is. Columbus's big development is that he incorrectly calculated how big that is. He thought the world was just much smaller and thus it was possible to traverse, uh, to go east by going west. Yes, <laughs> because he was wrong about how big that ocean would have to be in order to do it. So most people just did not know that North America was there. And so they thought it was nothing but ocean and therefore not crossable. Uh, another thing I want you to know is about Hypatia of Alexandria, one of the key thinkers in uh Ptolemaic, well, the legacy of Ptolemaic Egypt, uh, where she was a philosopher, astronomer, and mathematician. So the idea that great men make history and they do all the thinking, that doesn't apply. Hypatia is about as good as it gets. And we forget her. 
Um, Aristotle, that guy. Yes, he is the father of empiricism. We're going to learn a little bit more about that in a couple weeks. Um, empiricism is the study of nature by observation, right? You might know it as the scientific method. Um, he also wrote about a lot of other things, which we are not going to get into. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let this slide do its thing. Uh, yeah. The big thing, though, that I want you to take note of is that Aristotle is the father of our current brand of racism. Yay! Uh, no, it did not emerge with the slave trade. It certainly took on a very different character. Um, and no, it wasn't even new in the Middle Ages. Like, this is classic stuff. So the Greek idea, really the Hellenistic idea of... Um, well, I guess it's classical Greek. Aristotle crosses the border. He was the tutor to Alexander. So he's literally learning from the classics, Plato, uh, but he's teaching Helen, the Hellenism guy. So he's right there on the cusp. And the, the, the climate theory as to why there's different weather in different places around the globe is because of the temperate and tropical and the equatorial zones, I should say, right? The northern temperate zone is habitable. That's why you have Europe and North Africa um, and civilizations in Asia, but that in the middle is an absolutely uninhabitable equatorial zone. And the only people who live there are almost animals, is essentially what Aristotle does. The climate theory doesn't say that. Aristotle marries that climate theory to a theory about why people have different skin tones, right? In the equatorial zone, the sun is so intense and hot. That's why their people have black skins, right? And the farther north you go, the whiter they get. That's his theory. That obviously does not hold true because there are people who are colors other than white and black, and they live in places other than this little band from south to north. <laughs> Um, also, they totally don't know anything that exists on the other side of the equator. <laughs> funny, funny fact. Um, but the idea that there are different races and that they are substantially different types of creatures and that you can distinguish them by their skin, which is connected to where they are from, that originates with Aristotle. Some other things that happened, Damascus steel, like some of the tech of the ancient world is literally so good we don't know how to reproduce it. Damascus steel, we could not figure out until we could take a scanning electron microscope to it. Like it works on the quantum level. How, how do they know how to do quantum physics in 300 BCE? It's a thing. Um, everything is more complex than at first glance. So I'm going to end here with the fall of Rome. Huh, don't we always? And I want to point out that a lot of times the fall of Rome is written as the invasion of the Goths and the Austrians. I'm going to end here with the fall of Rome. Everything is more complicated than it looks at first. So we often think about the fall of Rome as the invasion of the Goths, the Ostrogoths and the Visigoths. Um, and that is a part of what's happening. But when we only look at that as a picture, or another thing that we teach often is the the Anglo-Saxons, right? As if there is a group of Anglo-Saxons who settle England. That is not at all how that story goes. Um, we can talk about that another time. That is a land that is inhabited by Celtic peoples. Before Rome arrives, Rome attempts to colonize. Um, they get only so far and they're like, no, these people are crazy. Build a wall. <laughs> um, and that is why the Roman Empire only goes this far. Um, and when Rome is falling because the, the Goths are invading, the Roman legions withdraw from England 
which means that this guy down here, the king of the Romano Brits, the like intermarried Celtic and Brit and Romanic peoples, um, he doesn't have an army. And suddenly these crazy mofos are invading again. So what does he do? Hire mercenaries. That's these folks, uh, Angles, Saxons, Jutes, and Frisians, and he has them come on over, and they essentially have a racket, and they're like, oh, it'd be a shame if your nice little kingdom here burned down. You know, I, I could probably prevent it if you could give me some more land, bring my wife over, that kind of thing. That is literally how the, how the settlement of Britain happened with the Angles and the Saxons. There's no such thing as an Anglo-Saxon. That's not a thing. There are Angles. And there are Saxons, and they are mercenary invaders of Britain. <laughs> Not original. Um, and that's all happening because Rome is withdrawing, because Goths are invading. But then if you look farther back, why are the Goths and the Ostrogoths and the Visigoths doing that? Well, shit, man, the Huns. You can't talk about the fall of Rome as if it's happening in a bubble, as if nothing else that's going on in the world is affecting it. Look at this. The Huns are coming in from Central Asia and the people who live here, the Gothic peoples are like, well, fuck, <laughs> we out, right? So the Ostrogoths, they go this way and this way. They're like, well, Rome is a pretty good place and it looks like they're in trouble, so they get pushed out. And then the Vandals are also in this eastern area. Goths are coming down from the north. And the Huns are coming in from the east. And the Vandals are like, shit, man. And they take really like the long way around. I don't know if they're going for Rome or what. But they're like, no, nah, let's just run from the Huns. Run, 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 run. Ah, shit. Ran into the Huns. Keep running. Run, 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 run. Ooh, down here. Iberian Peninsula. Forgot this existed. Um, and they come on down here. And they cross over into Africa. Africa, and from here, from Carthage, Rome's old enemy, they invade again. And the Visigoths come right out of here, running from the Huns, but they take a different route. They come right on down here through the Balkans and they come into Rome. Once they hit Rome, they keep going. They're like, yeah, okay, let's just keep moving west. The farther we can get from the Huns, the better, right? And the Franks, they're Germanic peoples up here. So this, this area is a Germanic peoples. Um, and as the Huns come in, they displace folks and the Franks are like, nope, we out. And they come on over here and they end up settling here. And this becomes France, right? All of the people in this part of the world have come from somewhere else. What is a French identity? Is it Roman? Is it Frankish? Because the Franks came from somewhere else. And before the Franks were there, there were Celts. And it's possible that there were people there before the Celts because the Basques were in Spain before there were Celts. Or what is now Spain. So we always need to think about what we're leaving out when we tell our histories. Because it matters what stories we tell and who we want to identify ourselves with. Writing history is a high stakes venture and it impacts the world that we live in all the time.